is an overflow room where you'll be able to see the presentations in room B1. So if you're not able to get a seat, room B1 has an overflow for presentation. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session on the European Guidelines. My name is Brian Williams. I'm from London. I was co-chair of the Guideline with Giuseppe Manchia from Milan, representing the European Society of Cardiology and the European Society of Hypertension, who developed this guideline in partnership over the past two years. Um, before we get on and give relatively brief, short presentations, after which, if we have time, uh, Giuseppe and I will take some questions um, at the end of the session. I'd just like to say a few words of thanks uh, uh, in relation to the preparation of this guideline, which has taken the best part of the last two years. Firstly, thanks to Tony Hegarty and Guy DeBacca, who act as, as the review coordinators, and uh, we were delighted to receive 200 pages of review comments uh, after the first round of review, but their support throughout uh, was terrific. Also thanks to Wilco Spearing, Ilianus Dusume, uh, Victor Aboyans, and Reinhold Kreutz, who supported both of us uh, in the development of the guideline, along with, of course, the members of the guideline task force, um, who all contributed enormously to uh, this project. Um, so these uh, should all be thanked because this has been an enormous task. The guideline will be published online on the 25th of August, coinciding with the European Society of Cardiology meeting. At that time, the slide sets and other materials will become available. But today, we're going to get the first look at the recommendations contained in this guideline. And the first presentation is going to be given by Krzysztof Narkiewicz on the classification of hypertension. Krzysztof. Brian, uh, Giuseppe, ladies and uh, gentlemen, in uh, the 2013 European guidelines, classification of uh, hypertension was based on office measurements. As you know, the cutoff point to diagnose uh, hypertension was 140 over 90, and we had three stages of uh, hypertension. The American guidelines last year introduced completely new criteria to diagnose hypertension, proposing that the cutoff point should be 130 over 80, and they limited the number of stages of hypertension from three to two. So what is the current standing in terms of the newest European guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology and European Society of uh, Hypertension? So addressing the issue, which measurement should be used for the classification, how many stages, what is the cutoff point? The first table already tells you about the, uh, uh, how to classify blood pressure in Europe in the year 2018. It is based according to office blood pressure measurement, and we decided to keep three stages of hypertension. And of course, the key question is, what will be the cutoff point? So the cutoff point for diagnosis of hypertension according to the newest guidelines remains at the level of 140 over 90. We have, as we had in the guidelines in the year 2013, the optimal blood pressure, normal blood pressure, high normal range of blood pressure, and then three stages of hypertension. Stage one, grade one, grade two, grade three hypertension. In our guidelines, you will have a lot of effort and a lot of discussion related to other ways to measure blood pressure, of course, the out-of-office measurement, ambulatory blood pressure, home blood pressure measurement. Professor Joseph Redon, in a moment, will address those issues with more uh, details. So if I would go to the key messages from our document, there are several key messages in the guidelines. 
the uh, uh, definition of hypertension as it reads the classification of blood pressure and the definition of hypertension is unchanged from previous European guidelines and it is defined as an office blood pressure systolic above 140 or and or diastolic above uh, 90 which is equivalent to uh, the value of ABPM of 130 over 80, but more details to follow in the presentation of uh, Professor uh, Redon. We should not uh, forget that about 20-25% of patients in Europe are unaware of uh, their hypertension status. So this is the reason we stress that every adult should have their blood pressure measured at least every five years and it should be done on a more regular basis in those with high normal blood pressure. So maybe you expect the earthquake at the very beginning, but this is not uh, the case. We decided to keep the classification and definition of hypertension as it was in the year 2013. Thank you very much. Thank you, very, thank you very much, uh, Christo. We now move um, to blood pressure measurement, uh, both in the office and out of office presentation to be given by Joseph Redon from Valencia in Spain. Thank you, Brian. That, uh, as uh, you can imagine, in uh, guidelines about uh, treatment of hypertension, blood pressure measurement is uh, mandatory to have a section. In uh, these uh, guidelines of 2018, has been uh, reviewed what is the relevant information that we have and we gained in the last years about the different methods to measure blood pressure, office, out of office, and even unattended has also been considered in a long section, but uh, finally, it's decided that we don't have enough information today to use and to recommend an attended blood pressure measurement. Together with the review of this, uh, there are also guidelines and uh, advice about when and how to use the different blood pressure measurements and there is finally something about what are the unmet needs in some of the methods that we are using. But to begin with, we have that what has been shown by Professor Narkevich that this is, that is considered the definition of hypertension according to different blood pressure levels and methods. Of course, we will maintain that office blood pressure is uh, the threshold will be 140 over 90, and was considered by consensus that daytime will be to define hypertension higher or equal 135 and 85, nighttime higher or equal 120 and uh, diastolic 70, and the 24 hour mean that 130 over 80. And home blood pressure was also consensus that was equivalent to the data. But that office blood pressure has also put bit in, in value. It is uh, recommended that the classification of hypertension will be based in that in order to define if it's a normal, high normal, or the different grades of hypertension. And uh, it is needed to use as a screening. A screening that is recommended in higher and 18 years old. And we will repeat it every five years, and even when we are becoming older, you will see more details about what will be the uh, frequency of uh, the screening. But the guidelines also collect what are the advantages of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring 24 hours of home blood pressure. There is a chart in which are reflected what are the advantages in order that the stronger pronostic evidence for 24 hours, nine time readings, measurement in real life settings, additional pronostic blood pressure phenotypes, mask, white coat, and abundant information from a single measurement session. And of course, it's stressed also what are the disadvantages? 
in terms of expenses are sometimes limited and can be uncountable. And uh, in the other side, what are the advantages of humble pressure, for sure, that is cheap, widely available. Another important issue, it is that help the patient engagement to blood pressure measurement and uh, can be easily repeated and used over longer periods to assess not only the level of control, if not also the variability, day-to-day -day variability. And of course, it that, uh, that today the disadvantage is that we have only static blood pressure and potential for measurement error for sure, but no nocturnal readings according to the methodology that we are using today. What are the clinical indications in the guidelines? These uh, at, in red are those concerning the process of diagnosis, conditions in which why could hypertension is more common, grade one hypertension on office measurement, and market office blood pressure elevation without organ damage. Condition in which mask hypertension is more common, such as high normal office blood pressure and normal office blood pressure in individuals with target organ damage or at high total cardiovascular risk. Of course, also, when we have the possibility to test if there are postural and postpondial hypotension and untreated, or exaggerated blood pressure response to exercise, that will be one way to detect mass hypertension. And also, when the assessment of nocturnal blood pressure values and dipping status will be useful as suspicion of nocturnal hypertension, such as sleep apnea, CKD, diabetes, and endocrine hypertension, or autonomic dysfunction. During treatment, of course, evaluation of resistant hypertension and also postural and postpondial hypertension in treated patients Evaluation of blood pressure control, especially in treated high-risk patients, and evaluating system consistent with high hypotension during treatment, and also assessment for nocturnal values during the treatment too, for sure. What are the scheme for recommendation? Well, it is recommended that when you have the situation in that the patient is in the high level then, you will see in high normal in between 130, 139, or 80, 85. That's important to move to the possibility or to measure blood pressure, office blood pressure several times, or if it's available, to use out of office ambulatory blood pressure or home blood pressure. Even that, the use of ambulatory blood pressure it recommended in some specific conditions that I mentioned before that was to assess better nocturnal blood pressure. Well, then it's uh, at the time to diagnose. It is recommended, as I say before, that office blood pressure as the first step and then or repeated office blood pressure, if not available, the other ones of measuring blood pressure outside of that. And of course, out of office and ambulatory is specifically recommended in several situations, in some clinical situations, such to identify that we are suspecting the y code to mass and the quantified effects of treatment for sure over the time. And how to use at the time to manage y code and mask? It is recommended that it should be measured blood pressure repeated in both office and also from time to time out of office at the time to take decisions in office and ambulatory blood pressure. And in the case of white coat and in the case of mask hypertension. And what are the gaps in evidence? We have uh, some gaps in evidence. The first is what is the optimal measurement of blood pressure in patients with atrial fibrillation. Cool. This is one thing that this is not totally resolved. And uh, what is the benefit of risk prediction yeah. of uh, the different combination of office and out of office? And I think that the most important one will be what uh, the outcomes based in uh, using office blood pressure can be repeated using out of office, can be better outcomes we, today 
we are not information about this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Joseph. So the next presentation is to be given by Enrico Agapiti Rosé from Brescia in Italy on global risk stratification in hypertension. Thank you, Brian, Giuseppe. Good afternoon. Well, as you know, cardiovascular risk factors frequently cluster with hypertension, and this clustering of risk factors has multiplicative effect on cardiovascular risk. Therefore, the calculation of the total cardiovascular risk is a uh, an important step in the process uh, of risk stratification of hypertensive patients. Uh, European guidelines suggest and indicate the cardiovascular risk assessment using the SCORE system. Uh, and this is appropriate because it uh, refers to a very large um, uh, data set uh, uh, recorded in a uh, um, large European uh, uh, population. However, it is important to recognize that uh, cardiovascular risk estimated by the score system is uh, increased by other risk modifiers, and in particular by the presence of uh, hypertension-mediated organ damage, especially by ventricular hypertrophy, chronic kidney disease, and advanced retinopathy, which therefore should be screened for in hypertensive patients. Here you see the factors that may influence the assessment of cardiovascular risk in patients with uh, hypertension. Many of them uh, are well known, have been uh, already quoted in previous guidelines, sex, age, smoking habit, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, diabetes, overweight, obesity, and so on. Some of them have been added, uric acid, early onset menopause, psychosocial and socioeconomic factors, and heart rate. In addition, as I said, hypertension mediated organ damage is quite important. They are unique in hypertensive patients for the certification of risk. And, uh, some uh, markets of organ damage are recommended using uh, uh, methods for assessing arterial stiffening, uh, for detecting left ventricular hypertrophy, renal damage, the uh, uh, arteriosclerotic and uh, arteriosclerotic lesion, as well as advanced retinopathy. In addition, established cardiovascular renal diseases should be taken into account for patients with more advanced risk. You can see that for the assessment of hypertension-mediated organ damage, some basic screening tests are suggested for uh, every patient with hypertension. This includes a 12-lead electrocardiogram, urinal albumin creatinine ratio, blood creatinine and glomerular filtration rate estimated by visual formulas, uh, CKD AP, and fundoscopy. More detailed screening can be performed with uh, now widely available technique, such as echocardiography, carotid ultrasound, also abdominal ultrasound that may give several information for the structure of the uh, kidneys, for the alteration in the abdominal artery, and the renal artery Doppler studies may be performed to screen for the presence of renovascular diseases. Pulse wave velocity and uh, ankle brachial index may be used for the assessment of arteriosclerosis and uh, presence, uh, possible presence of peripheral um, artery atherosclerotic diseases. In addition, cognitive function testing and brain imaging uh, are indicate in order to evaluate the presence of structural alteration in the brain and also cognitive function. Um, when there is a documented cardiovascular disease or a, a cardiovascular disease detected by imaging, 
such as a significant plaque on angiography or ultrasound, or in the presence of diabetes with target organ damage, mainly renal organ damage, or severe uh, chronic kidney disease, or a calculated 10-year score greater than 10%, then patients are automatically classified as those at very high risk. Those with marked elevation of single risk factor, even uh, blood pressure above 180 over 110, and uh, other people with uh, diabetes mellitus without uh, clear evidence of organ damage, present on left ventricular hypertrophy, a moderate chronic kidney disease, and calculate 10 year score 5 to 10 percent, these patients are at high risk. A formal evaluation according to the score can be performed in patients with moderate and lower risk. Um, for some uh, subgroups of patients, the um, calculation of risk according to score should be uh, corrected according to correction factors, such as for first generation immigrants to Europe. And uh, the multiplication factor may be above one in patients uh, uh, coming from Southern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Caribbean, and Western Asia, and below one as a multiplication factor for those coming from Northern Africa, Eastern Asia, South America. Here you see a simplified uh, approach uh, uh, indicating the uh, progressive staging of hypertension from uncomplicated asymptomatic disease to symptomatic disease, taking into account grade of blood pressure, risk factors, uh, hypertension, uh, 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 induced organ damage and uh, cardiovascular symptomatic events. You can see that uh, patients with cardiovascular disease, symptomatic, uh, and those with diabetes uh, and organ damage are all at very high risk. So cardiovascular risk assessment with the score system is recommended for hypertensive patients who are not already at high or very high risk due to established cardiovascular or renal disease or diabetes or a markedly elevated single risk factor or hypertensive left ventricular hypertrophy. Another point is that uh, hypertensive patients at moderate cardiovascular disease risk or high, or those with established cardiovascular disease, blood pressure lower and low will not optimally reduce their risk. These patients would also benefit from statin therapy, and even when blood pressure is well controlled. Similar benefits may be seen in patients at the border between low and moderate risk. Antiplatelet therapy, especially low-dose aspirin, is recommended for secondary prevention in hypertensive patients. There are a few challenges in the assessment of cardiovascular risk that should be taken into account. The age, of course, advances age uh, uh, is an indicator of high absolute risk, while uh, younger patients may be at low absolute risk, while they have several risk factors that uh, uh, may uh, uh, diagnose uh, a high relative risk. So this should be taken into account. The concomitant diseases are uh, usually uh, indicated uh, as yes or no, but uh, the impact of severity or duration of the disease uh, should be considered. As uh, what baseline level of cardiovascular risk predicts treatment benefits is not clear, and also the assessment of cardiovascular risk during treatment, yet the baseline value or the on-treatment value of blood pressure of associated risk factors or of hypertension-mediated organ damage. And this is my last slide. Again, going to the uh, hypertension-mediated organ damage, please take into consideration that all these markers may differ each other. Some of them are more sensitive to changes, such as uh, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy by magnetic resonant imaging, such as urinary albumin excretion, pulse velocity, more reproducible using electrocardiogram, the old electrocardiogram, magnetic resonance imaging, and glomerular filtration rate. Time to change is fast 
for album inscription rate. But what's most important is the prognostic value of change that has been rather demonstrated by changes in left ventricular mass, reduction of left ventricular hypertrophy, and also by change of glomerular filtration rate, much less for the other markers of organ damage. Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Thank you very much, Enrique. So we've now um, listened to the definition of hypertension, the um, diagnosis of hypertension by office or out of office blood pressure, and the methods for global risk stratification. We now move on to when to initiate antihypertensive treatment, and that will be presented by Luis Rulupe from Madrid in, here in Spain. Well, thank you very much, Brian and uh, Giuseppe. Thank you for inviting me to be here. So the first of my slides summarizes when to start with therapy, depending on the classification that Christoph Narkiewicz made of hypertension, and that was later commented by Pep Redon. So a high normal blood pressure, grade one, grade two, or grade three, lifestyle advice has to always, always be present. Physical activity, exactly the same, you know? But drug treatment, and this is new, has to be considered when high normal blood pressure is found in very high risk patients with established cardiovascular disease, particularly if it is coronary artery disease. In a grade one hypertension, immediate drug treatment in high or very high risk patients with cardiovascular renal disease or target organ damage has to be started. So the position was not maybe that aggressive in previous guidelines for this. But uh, drug treatment in low to moderate risk in the absence of, you know, cardiovascular disease, renal disease of organ damage, we can use lifestyle and physical activity for three to six months and then later to start with uh, drugs. Grade two and grade three, you know, immediate drug treatment in our patients. And, you know, the aim is to get a control in three months. So in other words, in three months, we must get probably to try a combination of drugs and might be to a spironolactone if those patients need it. So which are the class and level of uh, what I showed in the previous slide, you know, Prompt initiation of uh, treatment in grade two and three, class one, level A. Lifestyle intervention, class two, level B. We need more data on lifestyle. But all the intervention that I commented in grade uh, one, depending on the presence or absence, you know, of cardiovascular disease, renal disease, or target organ damage, all of them are level one A. Antihypertensive treatment may also be considered in frail older patients if tolerated to B and B. We need more data, but it is admitted that in frail elderly patients it can be considered if tolerated. Withdrawal of blood pressure lowering for those trespassing the 80 years of age is not recommended. They must be kept on the drugs. And here you see that in patients with high normal blood pressure, lifestyle changes in this particular group of patients is class one, uh, level A. And drug treatment considered when cardiovascular risk is very high is to be an A. You will find in the guidelines this uh, uh, figure where you can see the new in the uh, 2018 guidelines. First, in the diagnosis of hypertension, we are insisting, and you have seen the presentation, the, the, the presentation by Pep Redon. I mean, we need to make sure as much as possible, which is the real level of blood pressure in our patients. The, re, with respect to treatment uh, threshold, in high normal blood pressure, I mean, the change is that when risk is very high, you know, pharmacological treatment has to be added. In uh, low-grade one hypertension, 
you know, at low and moderate risk and without evidence, you know, drug treatment has to be started after three to six months. This is in some way similar to what was commented in the previous guideline. But when the risk is high, as you saw, I mean, we need to start, you know, pharmacological treatment. And in older patients, blood pressure lowering drug treatment and lifestyle intervention is recommended in fit older patients above 65 years, but not above 80, when systolic blood pressure is in the grade range of 140 uh, to 159. This is lower than what was contemplated, you know, in the previous guidelines. So, and for you and for me, in our daily clinical practice, uh, I, I added this slide because probably the greatest challenge will be in the area where the prevalence of hypertension is the highest and the risk is also the highest as a consequence of age. So less conservative treatment of blood pressure in older and very old patients. Lower blood pressure thresholds and treatment targets for older patients with emphasis on in, in independence and, uh, oh sorry, on considerations of biological rather than chronological age. The importance of frailty, independence, and tolerability of treatment are all to be considered. So in other words, I mean, in the elderly, we have to be more aggressive. Recommendation that treatment should never be denied or withdrawn on the basis of age, provided that treatment is tolerated, is one of the most important principles in these new guidelines from the point of view of intervention. So that's all, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you Lewis. Uh, next presentation, topic that's been an area of some controversy since um, the US guidelines, blood pressure treatment goals to be given by Giuseppe Mancia from Milan in Italy. Well, you will remember the target blood pressure recommended by the previous 213 guidelines, less than 140 over 90 millimeter mercury in the general hypertensive population, regardless the level of risk, somewhat more conservative attitude, below 150 millimeter mercury, but above 140 millimeter mercury systolic in old patients. Now, the new guidelines uh, decided that uh, evidence is available to modify these targets and to have uh, somewhat lower blood pressure values to aim at uh, with treatment. But this is not so much uh, because of the data from the SPRINT trial, because examining the SPRINT trial, the task force responsible for the guidelines believe that these are difficult to be interpreted because uh, blood pressure was measured uh, differently from virtually all other outcome-based randomized trials because there is no white coat effect uh, in unattended blood pressure measurement used in the SPRINT trial. And this can make a difference, uh, five to 15 millimeter mercury less, but this is not clear compared to the blood pressure values uh, measured by conventional office blood pressure approach. But apart from this, evidence from very large, well done meta-analysis of randomized trial do provide evidence that going well below 140 millimeter mercury and even below 130 millimeter mercury may lead to an incremental benefit. This is one extremely large meta-analysis published a few years ago in the Lancet, you can see that patients started from a blood pressure of 130, 139 millimeter mercury systolic, and the calculation was done for a 10 millimeter mercury reduction in blood pressure. So on treatment, blood pressure was below 130 millimeter mercury, and you can see that this was accompanied by a significant reduction in the incidence and risk of virtually all hypertension-related cardiovascular events. And then we have another large meta-analysis, which was published also recently. And uh, 
You can see that in this meta-analysis, what was, was done was to compare patients uh, in which uh, blood pressure was uh, reduced below 130 millimeter mercury systolic versus those remaining in the 130, 140 millimeter mercury range. In fact, actual value was 135 millimeter mercury. And you can see that once again, those in which uh, blood pressure was reduced below 130 millimeter mercury had reduction in cardiovascular events, which in most instances was significant. These examine also the more versus less intense reduction of diastolic blood pressure in the 70 millimeter mercury range, and those in which diastolic blood pressure was more intensely reduced had also an incremental benefit compared to those in which, uh, although being less than 80 millimeter mercury reduction was less intense. Now, in the face of this, uh, the task force also added some considerations which uh, suggest that nevertheless uh, some caution should be applied. Now, the incremental benefit uh, of uh, more intense reduction in blood pressure tends to be less and less pronounced as uh, low as blood pressure values move to the low range. Then there is absolutely no question that lower blood pressure values induced by treatment are accompanied by greater incidence and risk of serious side effects. Also, we have to take into account that already going to below 140 millimeter mercury systolic is very difficult in current clinical practice because uh, only a minority of patients achieve uh, a value below this uh, target. And also, evidence of beneficial incremental benefit by lowering blood pressure below 130 is not so strong as some very important clinical subgroups, such as, for example, patients with chronic kidney disease, older patients for sure, and to some extent also diabetic patients. So considering all this, this is the major recommendation about the target in the current European guidelines. The first objective of treatment should be to lower blood pressure to less than 140 millimeter mercury in all patients, including the elderly. So a major change from the past is that now the threshold for the elderly is not more less than 150 millimeter mercury, but less than 140 millimeter mercury. And this has a very high level and class of <coughs> recommendation. Then the second point is that, however, if treatment turns out to be tolerated and no problem arise, then one should try to go as close as possible to 130 systolic and even to lower values than 130 systolic. And based on evidence, uh, it can be recommended that blood pressure be reduced, uh, diastolic blood pressure be reduced to less than 80 millimeter of mercury. But, <coughs> As I mentioned uh, one moment ago, uh, this, uh, the evidence does not support uh, the same target uh, in all patients. Somebody may think that this makes uh, recommendations complicated, but it is highly unlikely that one target fits all patients. This is a sort of non-biological thinking. And in fact, the guidelines try to cope with this uh, by recommending a higher target in patients uh, older than 65 years of age, 130 to less than 140 millimeter mercury, in patients with <coughs> chronic kidney disease. And uh, the wording is uh, a bit more cautionary also for diabetic patients. And this is what uh, summarizes it all. You see in this slide the different targets in different conditions uh, and in general in hypertension. Then the fact that as patients get cold, target blood pressure value gets higher. Then what is the target for diastolic blood pressure, less than 80 but greater than 70 millimeter mercury. And one element of novelty is an indication of where, where you should not go with blood pressure values during treatment. And we feel that based on evidence, uh, this value below which we should not go 
is less than 120 over 70 millimeter mercury. It's the lower safety value, which was never mentioned in previous by guidelines, but we think uh, it is uh, an important uh, recommendation for clinical practice. Let me just mention briefly two other points. Guidelines extend the use of ambulatory and home blood pressure, and of course, an important question is, which are the target blood pressure values for home and ambulatory 24-hour blood pressure? Now, this is not available in studies because no studies are ever used in a randomized fashion, in a randomized trial design, ambulatory and home blood pressure uh, to define their target. But we know from observational studies that office blood pressure is higher than ambulatory and home blood pressure, but the difference uh, is uh, progressively reduced as office blood pressure is reduced. And the convergence uh, of these two values for ambulatory blood pressure is around 120 millimeter mercury systolic and 70 diastolic. So, and this is just a suggestion and an indication, we may think that 130 millimeter mercury of office blood pressure during treatment corresponds roughly to 125 millimeter mercury 24 hour blood pressure and less than 130 millimeter mercury for office blood pressure. Of course, many more data are needed in order to make this suggestion a stronger recommendation. And finally, uh, guidelines have an educational value and we thought that we should also mention gaps, uh, this will be discussed later, and limitations of knowledge. I mentioned that we do not have data on home and ambulatory blood pressure target. Data are much less for diastolic blood pressure than for systolic blood pressure. And finally, all data which you use to define target are based on patients somewhat advanced in age and in general with a high level of risk. Data on low risk younger patients are virtually not existing. And this is, of course, a big gap to be filled by proper studies in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. <clears throat> so the next presentation, before I hand over the chairmanship uh, to Giuseppe, is going to be given by Antonio Coca from here in Barcelona in Spain, who's going to bring us up to date with the guideline recommendations on lifestyle changes to reduce blood pressure and cardiovascular risk. Thank you, Brian. How to achieve the blood pressure targets that were just commented by Professor Mancha? Our guidelines state that it is proven that healthy lifestyle choices can prevent or delay the onset of hypertension and can reduce cardiovascular risk. Effective lifestyle changes may be sufficient to delay or prevent the need for drug therapy in patients with grade one hypertension. They can also augment the effects of blood pressure lowering therapy needed in the majority of patients, but they should never delay the initiation of drug therapy in patients with hypertension mediated, mediated organ damage or at high level of cardiovascular risk. But everybody agrees that the major drawback of lifestyle modifications is the poor persistence over time. Very difficult to convince our patients to be persistent in the adherence to lifestyle changes. The recommended lifestyle measures that have been shown to reduce blood pressure are salt restriction, moderation of alcohol consumption, high consumption of vegetables and fruits, weight reduction, and maintaining an ideal body weight and regular physical activity. In addition, tobacco smoking has an acute prolonged pressure effect that may raise daytime ambulatory blood pressure, but smoking cessation and other lifestyle measures are also important beyond blood pressure. So are important not only to reduce blood pressure, but also uh, for the prevention of cardiovascular disease, and even for cancer prevention. These are the uh, new lifestyle uh, recommendations in the guidelines. And if you remember, the recommendations in 2013 were quite similar, but the columns of the level of evidence 
uh, was doubled, if you remember, was the first column based on the reduction on blood pressure and the second column uh, the level of evidence in reducing cardiovascular events. Now uh, the task force decided to unify only one level of evidence that is based mostly on the effect on blood pressure but also on the cardiovascular risk prevention. The first recommendation is the sole restriction that is maintained because no many new studies modifies the older recommendation, but uh, there is a little bit change. If you remember, the recommendation in 2013 was re re reduction of salt intake between five and six grams per day. Now the recommendation is clear, is five grams, because the task force decided to adhere the recommendation of the World Health Organization. Five grams per day means 50% of the usual intake in the majority of the countries in Europe and more than 50% in some of the countries in the south of Europe, particularly Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Greece. The second recommendation is to restrict alcohol consumption. This recommendation is a little bit stricter. You remember uh, the old, uh, in the old guidelines, recommendation was based, based on uh, uh, the consumption in grams of pure alcohol per day. The task force considered that uh, this is a little bit more difficult to be calculated and then uh, decided to uh, make the recommendation on units of alcohol intake that is widely used. And then the recommendation is for men less than 14 units per week. This means two units per day. And each unit means 125 milliliters of wine or uh, 250 milliliters of beer, and half those for ladies, for, men, uh, for women. In addition, we add a very important recommendation that we cannot you know, concentrate these units in a, unit, uh, in a day, then it is not recommended uh, to uh, the binge drinking, so it's recommended to avoid binge uh, drinking. Increased consumption of vegetables is, uh, is the same recommendation, but we added the recommendation of using uh, olive oil, uh, particularly extra virgin olive oil, in, in dressing our salads because we have the very strong evidence based on the Spanish study, the Predimet study, showing a reduction in cardiovascular events in the Mediterranean diet supplemented by olive oil and nuts. Body weight control is also a very important recommendation. It's more or less the same, but if you read uh, this recommendation, uh, we emphasize that try to, get, to go a little bit further in the reduction of the abdominal perimeter that was recommended in the old guidelines. Regular aerobic exercise is maintained, and finally, smoking uh, cessation and supportive care uh, and referral to smoking cessation programs are recommended. The importance of these recommendations is emphasized in several parts of the guidelines, and I will summarize very quickly, for instance, in the initiation of uh, treatment, because you may see that in all stages, for all blood pressure levels, lifestyle changes are recommended. When we look at the table of recommendations with the initiation of hypertension treatment, we may see that when we talk on patients in grade one hypertension, once more, lifestyle changes are recommended at the first step. And also, when uh, we are talking on patients in high normal blood pressure, except for those in high normal blood pressure with high cardiovascular risk, but for in the general uh, population of high normal blood pressure, only lifestyle changes are recommended. When we look at the uh, resistant hypertension, in recommendations in resistant hypertension, reinforcement of lifestyle treatment, especially sodium restriction, because it is well known that excess of sodium intake may be one of the reasons to resistant hypertension. When we look at the management of white coat hypertension and mask hypertension in both situations, in white coat hypertension patients, it is recommended to implement lifestyle changes. 
and also when we are talking on mass hypertension, also lifestyle changes are recommended to reduce cardiovascular risk. Of course, there are caps in evidence, particularly concerning the, the story of the salt intake. So uh, in, in this list of GAFOR evidence, what is the optimal salt intake to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality is not known. We need much more uh, studies on this. And what are the long-term outcomes benefits resulting from the recommended lifestyle changes? We don't know because we need more studies. Finally, in the key messages of our guidelines, is stated that hypertension treatment involves lifestyle interventions and drug therapy. Many patients with hypertension will require drug therapy, but lifestyle interventions are important because they can delay the need for drug treatment or complement the blood pressure lowering effect of drug treatment. Moreover, lifestyle interventions such as, such as sodium restriction, alcohol moderation, healthy eating, regular exercise, weight control, and smoking cessation all have healthy benefits beyond their impact on blood pressure. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure that you now would like to know how we should lower blood pressure when patients need antihypertensive treatment. And, uh, this will be presented by Brian Williams uh, from UK. Okay, let's get into the drug treatment. As we've already emphasized, one of the key factors that we paid emphasis to in developing these guidelines was the fact that blood pressure control rates remain poor, typically less than 50% of our treated patients. <clears throat> we also recognized that blood pressure control was likely to become even more challenging with new treatment targets, particularly new treatment targets in the elderly where sometimes blood pressure is a challenge to control. We recognize that most patients in our trials require combinations of drugs to control blood pressure. It's an important message of this guideline that monotherapy is usually ineffective therapy for hypertension. The traditional initial monotherapy and step care approach to treatment has resulted in too many patients remaining on monotherapy. There is undoubtedly medical inertia. <clears throat> in addition, we heard in the previous talk about the problems of compliance. Well, the same is true in drug therapy. And we have good evidence now that compliance deteriorates as the numbers of drugs or pills increases. Initial dual therapy combination therapy has the potential to provide fast, efficient, well-tolerated, more consistent, and more effective blood pressure control. Single pill combination therapy has the potential to provide better compliance with therapy because patients prefer to take one pill if they have to take any drugs at all. And single pill combinations combining the preferred drugs for the treatment of hypertension are now widely available, both in branded and generic forms as dual and triple therapy combinations. So this together provided the opportunity to consider a pragmatic and simplified approach to treatment with the sole objective to improve adherence to therapy, reduce pill burden, and improve blood pressure control. So our first recommendation is firstly around the drugs that we should be using. We state that among all antihypertensive drugs, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, CCBs, and diuretics, that's thiazides and thiazide-like diuretics such as clothalidone and endapamide, have documented effective reductions of blood pressure and cardiovascular events in randomized clinical trials. And these are therefore our mainstays for treatment. This is a class 1A recommendation. <clears throat> Combination treatment is recommended for most hypertensive patients as initial therapy. This is a big change. Preferred combinations should combine a RAS blocker, that's uh, either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, with a CCB or a diuretic other combinations 
may include any of the five major recommended classes. It is recommended that beta blockers are combined with any of the other major drug classes when there are specific clinical situations for the use of beta blockers, such as angina, post-MI, heart failure, heart rate control. And it's recommended to initiate treatment, initiate treatment with a two-drug combination, preferably as a single pill combination. And the exceptions are in the frail older elderly or those with mild grade one hypertension who are close to the level of control where monotherapy might still suffice. It is recommended that if blood pressure is not controlled with a two drug combination, treatment should be increased to a three drug combination, usually a RAS blocker, CCB, and thiazide or thiazide like diuretic, preferably again as a single pill combination. And it's recommended that if blood pressure is not controlled with a three drug combination, treatment should be increased by the addition of low dose spinalactone or if not tolerated, another diuretic such as amylaride or higher doses of other diuretics, a beta blocker or an alpha blocker as these are the drugs where we have now an evidence base. And the combination of two RAS blockers, an ACE or an ARB or any other RAS blockers is not recommended. <clears throat> there is of course a table of compelling and possible contraindications for the use of antihypertensive drugs. I'm not going to go through this table as it's familiar to many of you, but there is no longer a table on compelling indications because most patients will now be treated with a dual therapy combination combining a RAS blocker and a CCB or a diuretic which will cover almost all indications. So this is the treatment algorithm. Starting with one pill, no, but not with one drug. Starting with one pill, perhaps, as initial therapy of an ACE or an ARB with a CCB or a diuretic. Consider monotherapy in low-risk grade one hypertension or very old uh, patients who are frail. If that doesn't work, move to step two, which is triple therapy combination, ACE or ARB, CCB, diuretic, again, ideally as one pill. We believe that with this strategy, we will see up to 80% of patients controlled with a single pill. If that doesn't work, add in spinalactone or another diuretic alpha blocker or beta blocker, and at that point, consider referral for a specialist opinion for evaluation of potential underlying causes. And for beta blockers, consider beta blockers at any point in this treatment algorithm where there's a specific indication for their use, heart failure, angina, post-MI, atrial fibrillation, and in young women who are contemplating pregnancy um, and want to avoid some of the other drugs, particularly the RAS blockers. The other important point here is that because we're using combinations of drugs that are often used for uh, multiple conditions, the core treatment algorithm is also the appropriate algorithm for the treatment of patients with all aspects of hypertension mediated organ damage, cerebrovascular disease, diabetes, and peripheral artery disease. There are a number of other treatment algorithms. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but here's a couple of examples. For coronary artery disease, we recommend as part of the initial therapy of these patients, in addition to what they would normally receive for their blood pressure, a beta blocker as part of the combination of treatment and as part of the triple combination in these patients. And in addition, as you've heard, consider initiating therapy when systolic blood pressure is above 130 in these very high-risk patients, and particularly in patients with coronary artery disease, because the evidence isn't that substantial in this population, but it's probably strongest most of all for people with coronary disease. For people with chronic kidney disease, the treatment strategy is an ACE or an ARB or the CCB or a diuretic, but obviously in patients with a GFR below 30, the, the loop diuretic would replace a thiazide diuretic. And of course, in resistant hypertension, when the GFR is less than 45 or potassium is above 4.5, we need to be particularly cautious about the use of mineralocorticoid antagonists such as spinalactone, because this can result in an elevated potassium or significant decrement in creatinine. 
The other point here is that unless creatinine rises more than 30% on treatment, we shouldn't be that concerned because we expect this to happen as part of blood pressure lowering, particularly to new targets. However, anything above 30% increasing creatinine should raise the alarm of possible underlying renovascular disease. So the key messages here are starting treatment in most patients with two drugs, not one. This guideline sets out to normalize the concept that initial therapy for the majority of people with hypertension should be with a combination of two drugs, not a single drug. The only exception would be the limited, limited number of patients with lower baseline blood pressures close to their recommended target who might achieve that target on a single drug or in some frail, old or very old patients who a more gentle reduction in blood pressure might be desirable. We're also advocating a single pill strategy to treat hypertension. Research has shown the direct correlation between the number of pills and poor adherence to medicine. And single pill combination has been shown to improve adherence. Single pill combination therapy is now the preferred strategy for initial true drug combination treatment of hypertension and for three drug combination treatment when required. This strategy is, dead, is focused on controlling blood pressure more effectively in most patients with a single pill, and we believe it could transform control rates for hypertension. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure now to invite to the podium Professor Tsoufis from Athens, uh, and he will discuss the device-based hypertension treatment. Thank you, Giuseppe. Last decade, a series of minimally invasive procedures, catheter-based or device-based, have been developed for, the, for reducing the high blood pressure, initially in patients with resistant hypertension. The rationale for the development of these interventional procedures include unmetered needs in the therapy of uncontrolled hypertension, the high rate of uncontrolled hypertension, as well as the pathophysiological, the favorable pathophysiological background. Most of these uh, procedures, including renal denervation, baroreceptor stimulation, carotid uh, bulb uh, expansions, and, uh, uh, then, and uh, also carotid denervation, target autonomic modulation, while the creation of a fistula at the level of iliac artery and vein targets mechanical aspects of the circulation. The current 2018 hypertension guidelines downgrade the recommendations for the uh, catheter-based and device-based therapies in hypertension from grade 2B uh, to grade 3. Pra indeed, uh, use of device-based therapy is not recommended for the therapy of hypertension unless in the context of clinical studies and randomized control trials until further evidence regarding their safety and efficacy become available. Why this happened? Why this uh, uh, downgrade? At least there are two reasons. The first, we don't have solid data of long-term safety and efficacy for the majority of these procedures, with the exception of renal denervation. And the second reason, the studies that have been positive for renal denervation regarding its efficacy in reducing the high blood pressure have been published after the, that, the, uh, written, uh, that uh, the guidelines have been written. Just to keep uh, in mind that uh, in 2013, uh, the European guidelines took into account uh, the first series of feasibility and safety studies and the, the HTN2 study, which was a randomized control trial but not included the some ablation arm. And these studies uh, showed a huge uh, decrease in blood pressure. But the new guidelines 2018 took into account the HTN3 study, which did not meet the primary efficacy uh, endpoint. And a great disappointment that uh, everyone remembers uh, uh, was prepared. 
Uh, later on, 2015, the Denner study was uh, published, which was positive, a control uh, study, a randomized control study. And uh, after that, some analysis of HTN3 contributed significantly to understand what uh, was the reason for the failure of HTN3. At least three confounders have been identified related to uh, changes in um, medication adherence, changes in the dose of drugs, inappropriate stunted population included patients with isolated systolic hypertension and procedural aspects related to incomplete denervation. Uh, Additionally, our understanding about the location and the distribution of renal fibers within the arterial wall has been improved um, based on the preclinical studies. The uh, second European uh, ex body of experts, the Clinical Consensus Conference, uh, provide some recommendations for the design of the future studies. And based on this, uh, last September, European Society Cardiology meeting, the spiral of medication study was published. And a couple of weeks ago in the EuroPCR, two studies, um, randomized control, some ablation arm um, uh, studies were published. The spiral alone in hypertensive patients with one, two, or three medication, and the radiant soul uh, in patients of medication. Additionally, no one of these studies raised any concerns about um, the safety of renal denervation. These three positive studies um, uh, we appreciate here were positive because uh, these studies, the studies represent the new generation of randomized control, uh, some control studies. And they provide an excellent short-term safety profile. They showed similarity in the average blood pressure decrease achieved by using different technologies in page on and off antihypertensive medication. Average reduction achieved by renal denervation in ambulatory and off systolic blood pressure is uh, 6 to 8 and 10 millimeters of mercury, respectively. In the light of meta analysis with oral antihypertensive medication, we can expect that a 10 millimeter reduction in office systolic blood pressure achieved by in renal denervation trials, if maintained long term, would be associated with a reduction in cardiovascular event by roughly 25%. However, uh, these studies uh, are associated with uh, some limitations, included mainly the short term follow up. The small number of included patients, and uh, there are also questions about the durability of achieved systolic blood pressure reduction and the long term is safety. There are a number of unanswered questions. What the target hypertensive population for renal denervation? How to identify those who respond most to renal denervation? How to verify effective renal nerve ablation? And what the role of renal denervation in other conditions beyond hypertension? It seems that we have interesting times ahead, and towards this end, the HTN pivotal trial is ongoing, a larger trial in hypertension and beyond hypertension is under development. Based on the above, I think that in the hot question, if there is any role for device-based therapy for the treatment of hypertension, what is written in the current guidelines is absolutely justified. To date, the results from these studies have not provided sufficient evidence to recommend their routine use. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Costas. And now we move to the next uh, presentation, hypertension treatment in specific conditions. And Roland Smeder from Erlangen, Germany, will give the presentation. Dear Giuseppe, dear Brian, dear colleagues, it's now my pleasure to present the recommendations with respect to hypertension treatment and specific conditions. There are too many specific conditions to mention all here, so I did a selection of some conditions and selected those where hypertension is a crucial factor in the progression of the condition, in other words, the comorbidity. Let me start with resistant hypertension. 
In 2013, there was a more cautious wording saying that mineral catechoid receptor antagonist amyloride and the alpha-1 blocker doxazosine should be considered if no contraindication exists. In 2018, and this is due to the pathway study, we have now a class one recommendation that low-dose bonalactone should be added to existing treatment and if intolerant, they could be replaced by a plurone, amyloride, higher dose tyrosite or tyrosite like diuretic or loop diuretics, or the addition of bisoprolol and doxazosine. Clearly, you will recognize the results from the pathway trial. In the guidelines, we have also a very specific chapter about resistant hypertension, for example, highlighting that there are specific characteristics such as older age, obesity, or excessive diet to sodium intake. And it is spelled out that these patients usually have target organ damage. And also mention, I think, that it's important to halt for a moment to think, could this patient with resistant hypertension have secondary causes of hypertension listed here and also outlined in the guidelines? And most important also, don't forget that there are other drugs that are prescribed that raise blood pressure and bring a patient into the stage of persistent hypertension, such as oral contraceptives, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and others as well. So let me start with one of the comorbidity or condition diabetes and hypertension. The initiation, this has been already clearly mentioned, we start treatment if blood pressure is above 140 over 90, evidence is there, recommendation 1A. And also, what is the target? The target is 130 millimeter mercury and lower, if tolerated, but not lower than 120 millimeter mercury, 1A. So we have a target range between 120 and 130 millimeter mercury with respect to systolic blood pressure. And then also in this chapter, it is specified that in older patients, meaning above 65 years, target to a blood pressure range 130, but lower than 140. So in other words, be more cautious in the beginning. Be, do, don't be too ag aggressive in these older populations, but surely below 140. Diastolic blood pressure should be below 80 millimeter mercury, but again, a warning, not lower than 70 millimeter mercury because we have extensive secondary analysis of large-scale studies, and they are uniformly come to this conclusion that we also need in these patients a lower border, which we shouldn't go below them. What kind of drug is recommended? Well, to initiate drug, and this is in the, like in the uncomplicated hypertension, RAS blocker with a CCB or RAS blocker with a tyrosite or tyrosite-like diuretic. And there's also clearly spelled out a no-go, as in the 2013 guidelines, no place for the combination of an ACE and ARP combination. Let me move to the next condition, chronic kidney disease. Brian elucidated to that, but I want also to draw your attention to some comments which are in the text of the guidelines. It stated there that reduction of albuminuria has also been considered as a therapeutic target. And then later on it states whether reducing albuminuria per se is a proxy for cardiovascular disease prevention remains unresolved. There have been several studies, post hoc analysis, that indicated the, the, the answer would be a yes, but there are also inconsistencies in the data, and therefore this really remains unresolved. Sodium restriction is crucial in patients with chronic kidney disease who have hypertension. And as already mentioned, at the latest, if the EGFR is below 30 meter minute per 1.3 point square meter, we need to replace tyrosite diuretics and tyrosite-like diuretics with a loop diuretic. In some patients, it might be on an individual basis that this might be already take place in higher EGFR ranges, but below 30, there is no place for tyrosite diuretics it needs to be replaced. And then, as already stressed, 10 to 20% rise of each year far, this happens because we lower blood pressure and then we lower the perfusion pressure. If it's above 50%, we need to stop. 
That's also one recommendation from the Nephrology Society. And of course, if we have a high fall in each EFR, our thoughts should go in the direction, have we excluded secondary hypertension, I mean renal artery stenosis. Initiation of blood pressure, above 140 over 90, like already mentioned, also for uncomplicated hypertension. Now, with respect to the target, it was difficult to come to a good conclusion. It stated systolic blood pressure to a range of 130, but for sure less than 140 millimercury. You see here, we don't, can talk about 120, just simply because of lack of evidence. And the, it is, I think, very wise to spell there might be individualized therapy, and in the text of the recommendations, there are three or four studies really spelled out saying, well, there might be situations where you want to go, in, where you want to go lower towards the direction of 120. For example, one patient-based meta-analysis showed clearly in patients with albuminuria, with overt proteinuria, that this is the more beneficial uh, target blood pressure if you go towards 120 millimercury. And there are two nephrology trials, not really totally convincing, but supporting this conclusion. Now, what kind of drugs should be used? Rest blockers are more effective at reducing albuminuria, no doubt about that. This is in consistency with all guidelines from the nephrology or diabetes community that rest blockers should be on board and part of a treatment strategy, in particular in patients who have albuminuria, microalbuminuria, or proteinuria. Combination of RAS and CCB or a diuretic is recommended as initial therapy. This simply depends whether the patient has volume expansion, in other words, edema or not. And again, a no-go for the combination of two rust blockers. With respect to heart failure, there's nothing really sensational. It is consistent with the recommendations for patients with heart failure, ACE inhibitors, ARP and a beta blocker, diuretics and amino acid receptor antagonists are the preferential drugs that should be used, recommendation 1A. And dihydropyridine CCPs may be added if blood pressure control is not achieved. In patients with HEFPEF, well, the same thresholds, the same target values, because they are like the patients with reduced ejection fraction. And since we have no data, we cannot recommend any specific drug class for patients with HEFPEF. In patients with LVH and earliest disease, of an earlier stage of hypertensive disease, systolic blood pressure should lower to a range of 120 to 130 millimeter mercury. Finally, and that's my last condition I want to stress, is patients with coronary artery disease. Brian stressed already the point that we should start therapy in patients with systolic blood pressure above 130 millimeter mercury because the evidence is there. Now, what's the target? The target, again, is a narrow range, actually. Target blood pressure to 130 and lower, but please not lower than 120. Again, there is convincing evidence that this might be too low and even harm the patient. In patients with respect to diastolic blood pressure, again, below 80, but please not lower than 70 milliliter mercury. In older patients, again, there is more cautious wording target to a range of 130 to 140 millimeter mercury. And the drug class clearly here, the beta blockers have their place where they should be used, particularly in patients with symptomatic angina, as holds also true for CCBs. Thank you. I would like to stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Roland. And now, next presentation will be by Michel Bournier from Lausanne. Patients follow up. Thank you. I think it's. Uh, so I'm uh, talking about the, the follow up of patients, and there will be uh, a two parts. Um, first, uh, <clears throat> after initiation of uh, an antihypertensive drug therapy, it is important to review the patient at least uh, once within the first two months to evaluate the effect on blood pressure, 
and assess possible side effects until blood pressure is under control. Now, uh, single pill combination therapy uh, should reduce blood pressure within one to two weeks and may continue to reduce blood pressure over the next two months, uh, telling you again that uh, the target is to have a normal blood pressure within three months. So probably we, you should achieve that with the single pill combinations. I think it's very important to verify the blood pressure control at three and six months in a newly treated patients because you know that these are also the patients at the higher risk of being non-persistent and stopping their drugs uh, within the first uh, six months of the first year. It is also important to assess the risk factors and asymptomatic organ damage uh, at least every two years. Um, one question is how to follow up subjects with high normal blood pressure and white coat hypertension. And uh, of course, these people are not yet uh, treated, but even when untreated, they should be uh, scheduled for regular follow-up, at least annual visit to measure office and out-of-office blood pressure, as well as to check the cardiovascular risk profile, and this can uh, change uh, over time. At annual visit, recommendation on lifestyle changes, which represent the appropriate treatment in many of these patients, should be reinforced. It is very important also that uh, in patients with white coat hypertension, it's really the out of office blood pressure which will be more relevant because of the, of the white coat effect in the office. The, the new concept in the follow-up is really to detect non-adherence to drug therapy. We heard that already from uh, uh, Brian William, but now I think the guidelines put a strong emphasis on the importance of evaluating uh, treatment uh, adherence as a major cause of poor blood pressure control, and those who were, who were there in the previous uh, sessions uh, have have been able to hear the many ways of uh, measuring uh, adherence. And I think we insisted on the key role for nurses and pharmacists in the long-term management of hypertension. The, the, the important role of uh, these two partners in, in healthcare is in, essentially in the education, the support, and the follow-up of treated hypertensive patients, and it is emphasized as part of the overall strategy to improve blood pressure control uh, over time. <clears throat> As, as, uh, the purpose of, the, uh, of these uh, uh, recommendations on the follow-up is that blood pressure should not be only controlled for a couple of months, but it has to be uh, controlled over years, uh, something for a lifetime. So the interventions that may improve adherence in hypertension are several. Some of them are linked to the physician, uh, and uh, at the physician level is to provide information on the risk of hypertension and uh, the benefits of the treatment, as well as agreeing, uh, as agreeing with the patients uh, on the treatment strategy to achieve and maintain the blood pressure control using, uh, as we heard, lifestyle measures and single pill based uh, treatment strategy when possible. I think we have to develop information material, uh, program learning, and also computed aid counseling uh, for patients, but also probably for younger doctors to learn how to do that and to you know, teach patients how to do these things. We have to empower the patients. We have to agree with him on the target. It's very important also to have a feedback on the behavior and, and clinical improvement. People, uh, patients have to be felicitated or, or enthusiastic about the, when they achieve something, like uh, reducing their body weight and achieving blood pressure control. And of course, again, we have to collaborate with other healthcare uh, providers, especially nurses and pharmacies. At the patient's uh, level, uh, we should encourage self-monitoring of blood pressure, including telemonitoring, uh, so we're sure that the data are not manipulated. Uh, we could organize group sessions, instructions combined with a, a motivational strategy, self-management of patients with a single patient uh, uh, guided system, uh, use of uh, reminders, uh, obtain family, social, or nurse supports when necessary, and also provision of drugs at work site. We try to include the drug therapy in the life of the patient, and if he's not able to take it at home, maybe take it at work. Uh, concerning the drug treatment, we have heard a lot about uh, single pill combinations. Of course, it's very important to simplify the drug regimen as much as possible, and that's the reason why we will favor the use of single pill combination therapy. 
and also try to uh, use reminder packaging. You know that a lot of efforts have been done in packaging with the, the calendar uh, in the packages, but very often patients don't even know that it is uh, uh, for that use and it can use them uh, to help them. In the health system level, of course, it depends very much from country uh, <clears throat> to country, but uh, the idea is to support the development of monitoring system, telephone follow-up, home visit, telemonitoring, and now also probably measurements of drug levels and other measurements of uh, uh, adherence. Support financially the collaboration between the healthcare providers. I think, again, this is very important. Uh, in some countries, having a reimbursement of single pill combination, it appears that it's not always reimbursed, but it makes life uh, uh, easier for patients. Development of national database, this is also very important for the follow-up of the entire hypertension population, including prescription data and uh, available directly for physicians and, and pharmacists. And of course, the basics will be the accessibility to drugs, which would be normally uh, available for everybody, but apparently not uh, everywhere. Uh, this will be the end of my presentation. Thank you. We end with a very short presentation, just to summarize what uh, is new in this uh, in these guidelines compared to the past, and then uh, which are the gaps in evidence uh, and the need for future studies. <clears throat> so I'm just going to briefly uh, review the new concepts in the guideline. Uh, we've listed these in the document uh, when it's published. The first one is around blood pressure measurement. Wider use of out-of-office blood pressure measurement with a BPM, but particularly home blood pressure, uh, is encouraged as an option to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension and also to try and better engage patients in their treatment. We are recommending less conservative treatment of blood pressure in old and very old patients, and I've summarized here the lower blood pressure threshold at 140 over 90 uh, for people up to the age of 80 and 160 over 90 for people aged 80 and over, and lower treatment systolic blood pressure targets between 140 and 130, getting below 140, targeting to 130, and an emphasis on the consideration of biological rather than chronological age, recognizing the key issue of frailty, independence, and tolerability of treatment in terms of individualizing therapy, particularly in the very elderly. We are recommending single pill strategy to improve blood pressure control. The preferred use of two drug combination for the initial treatment of hypertension for most people, normalizing that concept. Single pill treatment strategy for hypertension with the preferred use of a single pill combination and simplified treatment algorithms with RAS blocker ACERAB plus CCB thiazide diuretic as the core treatment strategy for most patients and beta blockers for specific indications. We've recommended not just new targets, but new target ranges for treated blood pressure to better identify the blood pressure target and the lower safety boundary of targets for treated blood pressure according to patients' age and comorbidities. And we think it's important uh, to emphasize that the, perhaps the poor adherence to therapy has been a major factor contributing to poor control of blood pressure we need to get better at detecting that, and we hope our strategy of single pill approach to treatment will help alleviate some of that going forward. And the last point, again very important, the key role for nurses, pharmacists in the longer term management of hypertension, recognizing that this is a partnership over the lifelong period of a patient to try and maintain interest and continue treatment of high blood pressure. Let me finish now with just two slides about things that you haven't seen. Um, there will, in the new guideline, be new recommendations on when to suspect and how to screen for secondary causes of hypertension, the management of hypertension emergencies, updated recommendations on the management of blood pressure and acute stroke, updated recommendations on the management of hypertension in women uh, and in pregnant women, 
updated recommendations on uh, different, ethnic, different ethnic groups and their impact on blood pressure, and also a new section on the effects of altitude on blood pressure, recognizing that a significant proportion of the population do live at altitude. Um, new sections on comorbidities, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, atrial fibrillation and arrhythmias, the important issue of oral anticoagulant use in hypertension, safe levels of blood pressure, hypertension and sexual dysfunction, hypertension and cancer therapies, which is becoming an important area of interest, perioperative management of hypertension, and glucose-lowering drugs that also may have blood pressure-lowering effects. And lastly, as you've heard, updated recommendations on cardiovascular risk assessment and management, the importance of using the SCORE system, the importance of assessing and detecting hypertension-mediated organ damage, and the use of statins in more patients than we do at the present time, and the use of aspirin restricted for secondary prevention. That's it. Thank you very much. If I can have the first slide. What's happened? Just not coming in? Yes. Yes, well, part of the guidelines have or should have an educational value, and part of it is also to mention where evidence is limited and afford the unmet needs and need for further studies. And this is uh, probably an incomplete list of the areas in which evidence is limited, recommendations are given, but uh, further evidence uh, is uh, highly desirable. And this uh, includes uh, diagnostic and treatment aspects uh, of uh, hypertension. I will not go through all the single items, but for example, we have extended the use of out-of-office blood pressure for the diagnosis of hypertension because there is enough evidence uh, that this may improve prediction of cardiovascular events and therefore categorization of patients based on cardiovascular risk. But we do not know how much is this improvement, how much predictability is improved. And this is, of course, an important issue because uh, ambulatory blood pressure will carry a cost and make uh, diagnosis of hypertension more complex, particularly considering uh, developing countries uh, around the world. Then there is uh, also, there are also many areas uh, in which uh, the benefit of treatment, uh, surprisingly enough, despite decades of research, have not been unequivocally proven. Uh, for example, uh, it's now recognized that mast hypertension and even white coat hypertension have a greater risk than that of normal tensor subjects. They are by no means innocent conditions. But these very common conditions do not still have any evidence of whether and to what extent blood pressure lowering treatment may reduce uh, this risk. We do not have evidence, for example, on long-term beneficial effects uh, of antihypertensive treatment. And if you think uh, what is happening today, we give recommendations about lifetime blood, pro blood pressure lowering treatment based uh, on data which come from randomized trials lasting five years and apply them to people with a life expectancy maybe of 20, 30, or even uh, 40 years. And for example, just to give another, uh, just to mention another point, there is unequivocal evidence that hypertension is important for the development of cognitive dysfunction and dementia, but we still are not certain to what extent uh, we can reverse this process by blood pressure lowering treatment. Now, also treatment targets. This has been discussed uh, in these presentations today. Uh, we know some but by no means all aspects we would like to know. 
No evidence about optimal target for out-of-office blood pressure when patients are treated, and uh, no evidence about whether in younger, low-risk hypertensive patients, uh, the lower the blood pressure, the better. That is, the treatment data, in a way, reflect uh, what we know from epidemiology. And finally, treatment strategies. There has been a major element of novelty in current guidelines, as uh, emphasized by Professor Williams, uh, movement from monotherapy to combination treatment in the attempt to substantially improve the rate of blood pressure control worldwide in Europe, uh, in first step, uh, and uh, remove hypertension from the undesired position of being the first cause of death and burden of disease uh, worldwide. But we still do not know whether some drugs may give benefit beyond the blood pressure reduction. And uh, we do not uh, know, for example, whether guiding treatment by organ damage improvement uh, and guiding treatment by out-of-office blood pressure rather than office blood pressure may make uh, patient's protection greater. So we listed all these conditions uh, in the hope to stimulate investigators in hypertension to engage into these very difficult issues, facilitate, uh, in a way, fundraising for these studies, uh, and also their acceptance by the scientific community and uh, by the ethical committees, uh, which uh, would be presented with uh, something which is uh, recognized by the scientific environment in hypertension as being unmet need of substantial importance for uh, people health uh, in the future. Thank you very much for <laughs> your interest in these guidelines on behalf of uh, uh, Brian uh, and all people who have worked very hard in the past two years uh, in the task force, 25 people. I can tell you that it has not been at all easy, and uh, we hope that uh, you will be satisfied by the results, and of course there will be criticism, but uh, we did our best uh, to try to have guidelines adhering to what is the current evidence. Thank you very much.